Hello and welcome back. This is a very short series where we very quickly go through the very basics of Blender. Today, I'll be showing you how to optimize your render before rendering it out. If you want to learn just how to render out your animation, make sure you check out the video in the description and I'll also append a little link on top of this screen. Okay, let's start. So this is the animation that I have. It's just a nice little moon swirling around the earth. Everything is transparent. And I also have just an HDRI and an area lamp if I go into my rendered view. So this is how my scene looks like. If you want to learn more about HDRIs, you can check out the link in the description. And I'll also append a video in this video. Okay, so I have a very basic HDRI. Now our render options will go through in our render properties. So the first thing I always do is change from EV to cycles. I find cycles to be a bit more precise. It gives me tastier results, so to speak. And if you can do change your GPU or rather device to, from CPU to GPU, if you have a GPU, GPU usually has better performance overall. Now let's look at the sampling. So render viewport, render sampling means it's going to be 200 samples. This means you can get away with some stuff and not with other. So this scene is pretty simple. So if you want to achieve this very soft look, you can just use very simple principles psdf shaders and the most important passes there are going to be the diffuse and the glossy or rather roughness when you're working with those you don't really need a lot of samples especially if it's very simple materials but the moment you start to work in glass and that sort of stuff well that gets a bit more difficult but we'll take a look at everything here. So usually by default, I have it at 200, but I can also drop it down to 100. Adaptive sampling, I don't tend to use it because there is a danger of artifaction most of the time. So I just leave it closed. Denoising, render and viewport. For the render, I set it up, let's say separately. For the viewport, I can just open it up and set it to optics. And it's just going to directly denoise my, my picture. But again, since the viewport is already fast enough, I just I just don't keep it open. Light paths is the next big one. Now, here is where things get a bit more difficult. So total diffuse glossy will go through all of these. Now, total samples is the total maximum number of bounces, excluding the transparency and the transmission. The diffuse and glossy are important for two things. So if we zoom into our little guy over here and take a look at this eye, you can see the reflection of the HDRI. Now watch what happens when I turn off the glossy and the diffuse and the transmission and the transparency, like everything, I turn it to zero. All of these things start to dull out, basically meaning you get duller results. They're not going to be as precise as they should be. So it's better to keep, let's say, a lower number on those. Now, if you're working on just an image, well, then you just keep the sample count relatively high. You can bump it, let's say, to 10. Uh, the diffuse can be at the default value of four, the glossy at four, transparency at 10 and transmission at 10. So that would be for a good still image. And this will also tie in with the resolution a bit later. So also keep that in mind. But for animations, this everything basically adds up. So if I just press F12 and render out this frame very quickly. So we did it in three seconds, approximately three seconds. But let's see what happens when I bump down the total number of bounces and let me pop down the glossy and the diffuse and let's turn off the transparency and let's press f12 again so it's still three seconds but it's much closer to three seconds though so that means that there is some connection between the number of these light paths and bounces so this is when you're working with very simple materials when you're working with stuff that's not very difficult to calculate you can go down as low as five four total bounces and you'll have basically the same result now we can move to the clamping and caustics and here we will need another material so for a scene like this that doesn't use any glass any transmission, any transparency, any clouds, I would just use a total of five, diffuse three and glossy three, and you should be fine. At 100 samples per frame, and also counting the denoiser, it's going to be lighting quick. Now, if I want to test out the direct, indirect, and caustics, let me just change the materials a bit. 
and you'll see immediately what I'm talking about. Let's make this transmission object just completely, completely bare like that. And let's drop down the roughness. So we should be able to see through it, but we don't. The thing is, we need to open the transmission samples and the transparency samples up so we can actually see the transmission of the object. So this means that whenever you're working with something that is glass or there is transmitting, so I've set this up in my materials tab, it means that you need to use these bounces. So that's very simple there. So let me just turn them off again so you can see the difference. Now, if I turn them off, you can see everything is dead black and you don't want that. Another thing with these samples, and I do suggest you use them at 10, is the clamping. So the moment you lower down the clamping and you render this scene out, first of all, the scene is going to be a bit, let's say, longer and heavier to calculate, but you'll also have a bunch of fireflies, like so. Now, if you want to get rid of those, the indirect light is the way to go, as well as the filter glossy. By default, I set the indirect at 4.5 and the filter glossy to 1.5. The problem with this is you may lose a bit of the lightness of the material. So you can see that most of those artifacts have gone away. There are still some because you would need to render at higher values. So let me go into another slot and I'm going to correct the render samples to something like 500. Now, this will take a bit longer to calculate as there are more samples in the scene. So this is seven seconds compared to the three that we've had before. But also compare the number of these little fireflies and like surface reflections. So the more you bump up the samples, the more definition you'll have on these very difficult materials. Let me change my materials back so I have everything as it was. Just a nice little reflective one. Again, I'm going to turn these down. So like I said, you need to take into account what your scene has. So if you have glass, it is suggested that you would use, let's say, 500 samples to 1000 samples with a total bounce count of, let's say, 10 and the transmission and transparency to about 20, which is fine for still images. But for animations, it's going to take a while to render out an animation like that without having too much noise. Now, I'm going to just jump down to film because I want to show you something real quick. So you would be used to this type of HDRI. So whenever you use an HDRI, you would see it in the back. If you don't want to see it, just go under film and check this transparent. And this is going to actually use just the alpha and leave the reflections of the HDRI. And while we're here, you can also notice the transparent glass. So if I move back to my moon and push up the transmission, set it back to roughness and let me return back to my transmission samples you can see it also tries to render the transmission material with the transparency but again not needed in this exact sample so i'm just going to revert back next thing to take a look is the performance now in my case i have the auto tile size on which basically selects how large your render tiles will be and the render tiles are the little cubes that appear on top like before you can open this add-on you can go under edit preferences add-ons and search for the auto tile size and you can find it here under render just check it and that should refresh it in your render properties in this one you don't need to do much here you can also go and calculate the tiles for yourself but i found out that 240 260 for my system is plenty enough and it works fine but i do suggest that you test stuff out on your own machine by doing let's say comparative renders so let's say we're going to make a render here that's going to last so three seconds 31 and let me go to slot number three and let's increase this number to be I don't know, let's say 500 by 500. You can see that it's not letting me because I have this auto tile size on. You can also click on this gear and then set it to, let's say, bigger numbers. Let's set it up to this one. Let me press F12 and let's see if this improves my render or not. So basically the render times number two was three, one. And number three, the one with the other tile size was 314. So yeah, it does improve it a bit. You can also try with smaller sizes, for example, and then go like this, F12 again, 3.02.
So there is no, let's say, hard and fast rule. You just need to test it out. Let the auto tile size do its job and see where your most optimal settings are. In this case, it was 128. You also see the calculate optimum size, which means it's trying to divide the screen in a 1920 by 1080 resolution. You can leave that as it is. Other stuff, bake, grease, pencil, freestyle, we don't need that. The last thing I just want to turn your attention to is the color management. So display device, you can leave it as sRGB. View transform is filmic by default, and the look is by default none. But you can see that there is a lot of this discoloration. So if you want to bring back a bit of depth to your colors, you can just use the high contrast or the very high contrast. Exposure and gamma are more, let's say, photography-based filters, and I would suggest you tackle that in a post-process thing rather than tackling it directly in Blender. Now, the last thing that remains to do is to set up the denoise, which is very easy. We're going to go into our view layer properties, which is this gallery icon type of thing. We're going to click on the denoising data, and now I'm just going to split my screen and choose the compositor. Click on the use nodes. And you can see my denoising sockets are ready. Shift A and add a denoise node, and then connect the noisy image to the image, denoising normal to the normal, and denoising albedo to the albedo. And this means your denoiser is set up. So if I render my frame out, it should have the denoise applied. Yep, it denoised it. So if I zoom in a bit and then change it to two, you can see that the noise has disappeared. The render time is 6.0 seconds, which is quite a bit, but this is because the denoiser in the compositor is being applied. And this is just a final trick that I want to leave you with. Usually you have this by default setting for the resolution, so 1920 by 1080 at 100% resolution. So this is the percentage scale for render resolution. You can try, however, one thing that's very interesting. So you can bump it to 200, which means this is going to be the double of the current resolution, it is going to increase the render times drastically, but you will have a much clearer picture in comparison to the one before. So if you find yourself struggling and you have very, let's say, splotchy pictures and not very sharp, you can use this to your advantage. Of course, like I said, with the compositor, we are at 20 seconds right now, but it is a much cleaner picture. So the definition is much better. This will take a bit to render out as an animation. And if you want to know how to render out this as an animation, you can check out the link in the description and the one I put on top. But yeah, this is basically it for this one. You can now apply this knowledge, try to figure out the light paths and the bounces and everything for your specific settings. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.